welcome everyone to our November coffee chat about biodiversity and sustainability. I am Laura Knudsen Murray. I am the GIS coordinator and community outreach assistant for IRISBG. With us today is Shanna Jones, our amazing community outreach assistant. Recording, presentation, and other material will be made available in our knowledge library. All of our previous coffee chats can be found here in the category articles and presentations. You can also follow the topic Iris BG Coffee Chats and be notified via email every time something new is published. The idea behind these sessions is that we at Iris BG would like to offer you a space where you can connect with your peers and have a chat about Iris BG and the issues that may arise through your work with your collection. We don't have a fixed format on these sessions, so please get in touch with me if you feel that you would like to present a challenge or talk on a topic or have the community answer a challenge, it can be big or small. Hopefully we'll make some new connections here today and together we might become a little bit wiser. This map is an overview of all of you who are here today. We love that we're a global community and we have some of the best curators all, from all over the world. So thank you all for coming. I know it isn't morning for everyone. Um, it's later in the day, but we really appreciate the value that having the community here for the discussion. So thank you for coming. Uh, we'd like to launch a poll, just giving us a feel for everyone's level of expertise using Iris BG. Are you just trying out the trial? Are you a novice, an intermediate user, or an advanced user? Our presenter here today is Emily Ellingson. She is a curator and assistant director at the Polly Hill Arboretum on Martha's Vineyard. She has been involved in public horticulture for a decade and has used Iris BG for her work for five years. She holds a master's degree from the University of Minnesota in applied plant science with a minor in museum studies. She's particularly interested in the role that public gardens play in plant conservation. She will be presenting on the work that Polly Hill Arboretum has done in relation to the plant conservation and biodiversity benchmarking through the American Public Gardens Association. Without further ado, let's welcome Emily Ellingson. Excellent. Well, have, good morning or good evening. I don't know what time it is for everyone here, but it seems like we've got people from all over, which is really cool. So my name is Emily. I will be talking about conservation, biodiversity, and sustainability benchmarking, but mostly just I've got quite a long presentation, so I might move through some things more quickly. If you have any questions, just let me know as we go along. And I have a couple of questions that I thought might spark some kind of conversation and also are maybe things that I've struggled with when I'm using Iris BG. So I'm first going to just give you an idea of where I'm at. Uh, so I'm on an island off the coast of Cape Cod in Massachusetts. So this is north. I, I should have put like a whole globe on here. Um, but this is uh, northeastern United States. And so we've got Boston here, Cape Cod, and this is Martha's Vineyard. Uh, Polly Hill, it says here, we're a charming 60 acre botanical garden from Google Maps, but I believe that to be true. We're in West Tisbury, Massachusetts. The island of Martha's Vineyard is about 100 square miles. 42% of that is protected open space, which is great. Um, we've got a state forest in here. Um, Polly Hill Arboretum, if you can see my cursor, is uh, this block of land right here, um, but it's also, you know, developed. There's about 20,000 people that live on the island red, uh, year round. And then in the summer, that population swells to 100,000 people. So there's some challenges with infrastructure, uh, but generally we have quite a bit of protected space. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background just about Polly Hill Arboretum so you understand where we're coming from here. Polly Hill is not just a hill. I actually talked to someone recently who from the island who thought that it was called Polly's Hill because we were on a hill and we're not, we're actually pretty flat, but Polly Hill was a person. Um, she, we call it, she had faith in a seed. So when she was 50 years old, she decided that she wanted to see what could grow on Martha's Vineyard. She had inherited this old sheep farm um, from her parents and decided to basically just start an arboretum. She grew plants from seed. She had connections with uh, gardens like Longwood and Winterthur. Arnold Arboretum, and 
planted seeds in the ground and watched them grow. One of the most amazing things about this is she started taking records for her private collection in the 1980s, computerizing them even. And during that time period, that was pretty cool for someone in, who has had a, mostly a private collection. And it was part of how the Arboretum came to be an actual public Arboretum was uh, David Smith, who is kind of a created the endowment basically bought the arboretum you know realized that she was a scientist in that way uh doing plant records and um so there's something that we hold very dear to our heart and i find very important in our collections we're about 20 acres cultivated so this kind of green area here is where we plant most of our accession plant materials but we also have 40 acres of preserved woodland um that is kind of in this bed back 40 actually <laughs> think about it like that and which and these two you can see two um, meadows here so it was actually said that Polly Hill would she said she would haunt haunt us if we actually planted in those meadows to keep sort of this historic uh sheep farm kind of I idea um, for the land but um something that I just learned which was really cool is that she didn't want this place to be a museum of herself. You know, she was very into plants and she wanted the Arboretum to be a vital resource for the island and for plant material generally. And so that gives us freedom to work even more on conservation and, you know, learn what's important to the island and to our regional and global community. So that's very exciting. She introduced a lot of different cultivars. We have our own nursery and greenhouses that you can see here where we grow almost all of our plants. We have really focused on wild collections over the last um, few years, or over basically since the founding in 1998. And specifically, we focus on plants of the Atlantic Coastal Plain from Maine to the Panhandle of Florida uh, and the Southeastern United States, the flora of Martha's Vineyard specifically, and then temperate Asia, Japan, and South Korea. We just went on a collection trip which I'll talk about a little bit to the Pacific Northwest. So we're sort of adding that region into our um, collections. So I don't know if you've all are familiar with the plant conservation and biodiversity benchmarking through the American Public Garden Association. But this is sort of how I was approached um, by Mari earlier for an APGA presentation was to talk a little bit about um, this benchmarking. So the, the benchmarking itself, you report on five different topic areas, um, leadership, governance, research, and expertise, ex situ and in situ conservation, and education and communication. And I'm going to be honest, you know, I've been in my position for one year, so I didn't do the initial benchmarking, but the whole point of benchmarking is that you actually keep doing it. And just by looking at these, um, the questions that this benchmarking asks you, you can get a sense for what you even could be doing. So that's been really helpful to just go through those questions repeatedly and see you know, how you can improve where you're at right now and then how you can improve in the future for conservation, biodiversity, sustainability. I'm going to, in my presentation, I have little call outs of like what I'm certain, uh, I'll just go to a slide so you understand. <laughs> um, I'll say like research and expertise or ex situ conservation. So that's sort of what I'm talking about when I'm uh, talking about a specific thing. But I'm gonna go back to this quick. So I have a couple questions for you all, but like I'm, I'm just gonna go through what we've been doing at Poly Hill and some of the ways we've been working on conservation and biodiversity and hoping I don't take up too much time and we get to talk. So I'm gonna go, go through this a little bit quicker. So we have a Stewardia Plant Collections Network uh, accredited collection. Over 70 plants in the ground of these of Stewardia. Stewardia is from, there's two species native to North America, but mostly um, Eastern Asia. Um, many cultivars that Polly introduced, that we've introduced, and are actively doing research in that area. So the two North American species, Stewardia, Mal Stewardia malacodendron and Stewardia oveda. This here is a range map of uh, malacodendron. So the silky camellia silky camellia and mountain camellia. We've gone on collection trips to essentially, we're looking for all the native populations of these plants um, and are collecting seed to propagate and to do research on. We have recently been working on how to 
best propagate these seeds. Uh, they're, uh, they're known to be have double dormancy essentially, so they may not germinate. They usually don't germinate the first year. You may wait a while, but we found through some of our um, experimental uh, treatments that if we give it 40 days or give it three months of cold stratification that with constant temperature at 40 degrees, not fluctuations in our outdoor greenhouses or overwintering structures, uh, we get really great germination. Um, so we've, in the last couple of years, 2018, 19, 20, and then 21, We've um, gone on collection trips, uh, collected seed, and they're, they're now growing in our greenhouses. Um, our cuttings, we've taken cuttings from our collections plants, and these also have been getting cold treatments in refrigerators consistent. We've moved them after like three months into a utility green. We have a utility house that we've been putting them in like this upper structure of it because it is slightly warmer and they've done really well with bud break um, and have had 70% success with cuttings. But something I have a question on is, you know, we're a small institution. We have eight full-time staff. I guess I didn't say that. Right now we're down three and a half of those staff members. So we're kind of operating at this, you know, maybe less than ideal level, but what kind of record keeping tools do you use to track research specifically? And do you use those or integrate them with Iris BG? Um, I'm interested to hear what how people maybe track their research. Yeah, I found that attributes might be really important. <laughs> I haven't created a lot of them, but um, for doing like, I even wanted to see how many conifers we had, but if I used evergreen, it wasn't necessarily conifers. And then I had to like, mine all my data and I'm thinking like well if this is something like a collection that we have that's really important um, I could just create an attribute for those taxa and it might be easier in the future any other thoughts on maybe even um so we do propag some propagation research and or or research that may have extra information that's not just related to attributes of how um, you integrate that with iris bg yeah, and Shanna had mentioned, we, we are actually talking quickly before this of, you know, you can actually add documents, you could add research papers into um, Iris BG, which is another good way. I am going to keep going and talk a little bit about something. So you noticed I probably just said, hi, Daniel, how are you? <laughs> and he's on my next slide. Um, so we just went on a collection trip to the Pacific Northwest to Southern Oregon and Northern California. Um, Daniel was part of that trip, as was Tom Clark from Mount Holyoke, uh, Martin Nichols Nicholson at the Hoyt Arboretum in Oregon, and Ben Storms is at the UB, uh, Daniel's colleague at the UBC Botanical Garden. We had a list of over 80 target species um, for for this trip and it was two weeks long. So it was an extensive trip, but some of the ones I wanted to call out specifically were uh, a few vulnerable species according to the International Union of the Conservation of Nature Red List, uh, Brewer Spruce, Baker Spice Cypress and Sargent Cypress. Many, for me, it was definitely a focus on conifers. For others in that group, it was conifers and herbaceous species. But we had, we also worked with Martin, you know, Jean had mentioned the GCCO, the Global Conservation for, or Global Consortium for the Conservation of Oak. Martin Nicholson had a grant with the USD Forest Service to collect acorns from a near threatened species, Sadler Oak. So it was a bringing together of different institutions in the name of, you know, plant collections, but also conservation. One of the things we learned going to the Pacific Northwest, I'm, I haven't done a lot of collecting or even work out in the Pacific Northwest, is there's a lot of evidence of large scale fire, which probably doesn't surprise anybody. Um, but something that was distressing uh, was that we went to an area that had recently been collected from, actually Daniel was on the trip, in 2018, where they collected cones from a brewer's spruce. And when we went to the site, to that GPS location, thinking this is when we're gonna see it, they were all burned and they were gone. So just highlighting the importance of conservation and the importance of doing work and going revisiting areas that you have, uh, have been before to see how populations are doing, which is something we also did with the uh, uh, Sadler's Oak. There hadn't been many collections of Sadler's Oak or any that were collected ex situ for or in ex situ collections from California. So 
that was a big push in the strip to, was to visit those sites and collect acorns, but also see just generally how they were doing. Something that was really exciting with that was found like after fire, they were regenerating quite well. And we kept finding them in different pockets and even where they hadn't been recorded before, which was exciting. We also collected cones from the Capressus bakeri, the baker's cypress, and um, found possibly a new record of the sergeant cypress, uh, which in Oregon, which is very uncommon, another vulnerable species. But unfortunately, some of these species had this specific site in Oregon had a lot of damage, which almost looked like human damage. Of course, we can't assume that totally, but uh, in another area we went in Oregon where there was brewer spruce, found the campsite that had clearly cut some of the seedlings down of brewer spruce. So even, you know, I guess I, I, I say this because education is also incredibly important, not just for ourselves, but for people who recreate in these areas and even like plants could damage them. <laughs> so another thing to think about. I'm gonna breeze through this one, I think. So at Poly Hill, we were in the Global Consortium for the Conservation of Oak. And I mentioned Martin's research with Quercus Adleriana, which is um, more on the West Coast, but we're all we're in the regional East Coast GCCO and have been collecting or receiving acorns, either going on collection trips to Florida, Georgia to collect acorns, or we've received some from Ron Lance and growing Quercus regiana, Strina, Boyntoniae, and Laurifolia, which are all target species for that region. The plan with these is, you know, to grow them on, distribute them to other institutions, or, uh, and keep some in, in our living collection. Switching gears a little bit, um, something that we struggle with well, the whole world struggles with, clearly, is climate change. Um, living on an island, we are particularly open to ero coastal erosion. Our uh, cliffs and have been retreating, and we're losing plants. We're losing buildings, also. Uh, something that Polly Hill has been involved with is a plant rescue of a state-ranked species, tri Triostium foliatum, which is horse gentian. There's actually, I think, a documentary about this lighthouse, possibly on Netflix, um, but it's the Aquina Lighthouse um, on Martha's Vineyard, and they moved it 100 feet back from the coast uh, because it was going to fall into the ocean, and it's a historic lighthouse. And in that process, there was a, this species was going to have to be removed. And so we worked with the Land Bank, which is a conservation organization on the island, uh, to take cuttings and root cuttings, which we had 65% um, success with, and then grow them in our trial beds. These plants have subsequently started producing, started to produce seed. And this year we found over 5,000 seeds produced from these trial bed plants, which we're now some of them we are going to be stratifying and growing on, and then others we're going to be seed banking with the Native Plant Trust, which is a, an organization in New England for our ex situ conservation. Along these lines, you know, the Native Plant Movement, I think, is getting stronger every day, which is exciting. Uh, but we are, um, for the last decade, have had a program called the MV Wild Type Program, Martha's Vineyard Wild Type. And this was a, an attempt to, a successful attempt to germinate, to, to collect and grow native ecotypes of native plants. And these then ecotypes were grown and sold either to homeowners for to use in their landscapes. Some commercial growing has happened, but we also mostly use these for restoration projects. So people can buy plugs online, they come in these we'll put them together for them and you know they buy plugs in groups of three. We also have some shrubs as well and then plant them in their home landscape. But some of the work that we've done with this program as well is actually plant uh, growing endangered plants. So in this summer actually we, or well last year we produced over a thousand plugs of the New England Blazing Star, Leatris novae angliae. Um, and this is a Massachusetts plant of special concern. It's 
critically important, uh, it plays a critically important role in sand plain grassland ecosystems, which are um, a critically imperiled ecosystem. There's, if you think of Martha's Vineyard, it's like an outwash from glaciers and very sandy soil, but we have this really cool ecosystem. New England Blazing Star is a, it has a great capacity to return after fire and after drought, so it's very important. And we contracted with the Nature Conservancy to plant some of these plugs in um, our fields or in the Bamford Preserve, which is in Edgar Town, which is there a, a site that they're actively restoring. And this is our director, Tim Boland, and greenhouse assistant, Linnea. And what was cool about this, besides the fact that we planted all of these plugs, was that it was covered by NPR in um, the National Public Radio in Boston and you know written about. And so a kind of a, a public facing project. So this comes to an, another question, which maybe isn't related to just what I was talking about, but we track, you know, these, we have this MV wild type program. We're germinating native plants, keeping records on these, but they're all sort of all over the place. How do you keep track of collections that maybe aren't accessioned, like your plant sales areas, or do you keep track of them in Iris BG? So we have a, an herbarium that we've been for the last decade, kind of around the same time that the MV wild type program started. Um, have been documenting all the plants in on Martha's Vineyard, but in Dukes County, which is Martha's Vineyard and a few like nine different islands um, off the coast of Cape Cod. We have some plant heroes, uh, Greg Palermo and Margaret Curtin, our, our research associates and volunteers who, who go out and document plants and create herbarium vouchers, which we then, you know, store and have digitized in uh, the Consortium of Northeast Herbaria and have just recently created this, um, a, an initial flora, which hadn't been done for, you know, 20 years or so. And something that's really interesting, I think, or, or something to think about is we have this herbarium. We also have a doc documented plants and plants from wild collected uh, expeditions that we have herbarium specimens of. And it sort of fits in with the, um, you know, I feel like we have multiple different ways we're gathering information. So we've got this consortium of Northeast Herbaria, which really we only have put our flora in, but we also have documented collections and wild collected collections that are in Iris BG and how should we integrate all of them together and how do we do that? So that's something that we're, we're thinking about right now. But this has been a really exciting project um, in a way that we've been very involved on the island, especially just documenting plants. There's an island, you know, conservation works best when you work with other people. Um, Biodiversity Works, which is an organization on Martha's Vineyard that does really great work, has a atlas of life where they have species lists of everything biological and use iNaturalist to create a lot of and mine data for a lot of those species lists, but if also, you know, will link to our flora on this website. So really good. I was just looking at this today too, and I was looking at all my tabs <laughs> that I accidentally put in here and just like weather, flora and naming plants. And I thought that was kind of funny. Um, and then a way that, you know, going back to the biodiversity and conservation benchmarking, a way that we communicate a lot of our conservation work or and others conservation work is through our lecture series. Some of our lectures are specifically like annual lectures devote, they have to be conservation related, but um, most of the ones we're doing now have either have to do with conservation, uh, conservation horticulture, um, and trying to bring diverse voices into onto Martha's Vineyard. So the last, well, it's not quite the last thing I'm going to talk about, but something that we've been working on is a staff housing initiative. The median home price of uh, or a median price of a home on Martha's Vineyard is $1.325 million. So if you can afford that, okay. <laughs> but a lot of people that were, um, you know, we would like to hire to be our plant propagator or a gardener, a uh, horticulturist, you know, that's not going to be uh, a possibility to buy a house, especially off the bat. So we've created this plan and had approved and have started building for two homes that are going to be specifically for employees, 
possibly interns do, but they have to be employed by the Arboretum. And I uh, really wanted to do this in a sustainable way. So we'll, we are um, going to have a denitrification septic system, which is sort of a new kind of septic system that uh, will help sequester nitrogen so it doesn't go into our waterways. We're right near a, a pond and uh, photovoltaic panels. So PVs or solar panels, an electric car charging station, consolidated area. We have, we're, Holly Hill is under a conservation restriction through the Department of Conservation and Recreation with uh, Massachusetts, which means we could not, we cannot develop unless it is approved and it is also been shown that it will help sustain the resource that is Polly Hill. So our argument was that, you know, we can't continue to take care of this land um, without employees who cannot afford to live here. So, um, but we, we use this natural oak opening from, or natural opening that happened when we had oak die off due to a few different pest issues went back and forth with the Department of Conservation to consolidate these houses into one, into an area that was, you know, less than two acres um, in our woodland area off of our parking lot and are going to be using all wild clay native lands, native plant landscaping uh, around the, the site. So we're incredibly excited about this. It means that we'll be able to hire some of these positions, hopefully that we um, have been missing. Um, and it's amazing how quickly the 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 work is is going. With um, we have a really awesome contractor who's been working at Poly Hill for twenty years, or a general manager, and using all local contractors. We've got one building that's going to start being framed, and another hole over here. And we're hoping to have this done by June or September of next year. Um, and like I said, something I'm very specifically excited about is using all wild collected native plants from Martha's Vineyard uh, on the landscape. So future directions, you know, you're never really done. That's the whole point of the benchmarking piece. Um, we participated in a, a collections assessment for preservation grant where we got the grant um, to bring two assessors out to the, Ar to the Arboretum to um, assess our living collections. In addition to this photo down here, our archives, we've also got a library. Um, and then our buildings as well to help us to provide recommendations and help us grow into the next basically 10, five to 10 years. And some of the takeaways from that, that visit was that we need to create a climate adaptation plan, a climate change adaptation plan in some way. Um, a way I did this in a previous position was uh, using the adaptation workbook, which the American Public Garden Association has had several I think at the, our last annual conference was a whole workshop dedicated to working through this workbook. It's a USDA workbook. And then creating an interpretive master plan for our wayfinding in addition to our education programs, um, everything we do really. We're also in conservation, continuing with the Global Consortium of Conservation of Oaks and looking to join the Global Consortium for the Conservation of Rhododendron. Hopefully another collection trip to California, doing a, we have a few different main collections, you know, at Poly Hill, which Anchianthus is one of them. It's a plant, a shrub that's native to Japan and Eastern Asia, uh, rhododendron, magnolia. So creating another uh, PCN accredited collection and then spearheading a red listing of a rare island endemic, the cutleaf hawthorn. When I look at this, I think, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> And we're understaffed, but it's also really important. And um, having you know these goals, and you know thinking about how to do that in the future. I mean, that's really how Poly Hill has succeeded in these things in the past, and are looking to do more. So, and G Jenna asked how many official collections are at Poly Hill. That's a good question, and I don't quite have the answer for it because it's it feels like. Um, you know, off the top of my head, I would say like five, because I think of like Magnolia, Anchianthus, Rhododendron, Stuardia, of course, and then we have a conifer collection that that was why we went to the Pacific Northwest was to some of those plants are dying and we want to bump up that collection. Uh, but I think there could be, there's even more than that. And we're working on a new woodland expansion garden, which will um, really be able to expand the things that we uh, collect.
so that's that's my presentation for just the work that we've been doing at Poly Hill. Um, some examples of yeah, examples of the conservation work we've been doing. But I'm oh yeah, I just thank you so much for listening. Thank you.